marathon continue? Okay, um, it has been a marathon day, but I've, I've, I have learned a lot. Um, and so we're gonna, it's almost like moving to something different, but it's really not. Because um, even though we're gonna be focusing specifically on shipping, we're focusing even more specifically on the very, very critical piece of shipping, which is the supporting infrastructure. So shipping can be safe, reliable, functioning. And moreover, how we're going to ever finance um, the infrastructure that we do need. And so with that, um, we, have, um, we have nice, um, we have some cooperation with the United States. So we've got a Canadian perspective, an American perspective. We've got the tourism industry. And I think what's excellent is Matthew comes in from um, the marine insurance industry perspective. And I think that's a very important piece of all of this. So, um, everyone's going to give a, a little bit of a presentation um, because I think it's important for us to know what we're talking about before we start talking about it. Um, and so, because <laughs> we want to know what we don't know. Um, and so we're going to start with Neil O'Rourke, and he's the Assistant Commissioner uh, for the Arctic Region for the Canadian Coast Guard. So. Okay. Well, thank you, Jessica. So what I'm going to do is, is give you a bit of an overview of what the Coast Guard is doing today and maybe talk about three things quickly uh, that, that impact the infrastructure conversation for tomorrow. So the slide behind me is, is actually a map of the Canadian Arctic along with the assets that we have there today. So we typically operate up to uh, seven icebreakers in the summer season to help with community resupply first and foremost. Uh, so kind of breaking ice to allow the, the, the marine transportation deliveries to come into communities. Uh, we are also up there to provide search and rescue uh, as needed as well as if there were any environmental response incidents. We also uh, have a series of kind of, uh, I guess, towers and shore-based infrastructure that supports safe uh, marine navigation. So that's all there in, in essence to ensure that accidents don't happen in the first place. And, and finally, maybe I'll just mention, you'll see on, uh, on several of these communities up there, and, and uh, you know, funnily enough, my colleague who doesn't work for the Coast Guard anymore to the right is the gentleman who actually set most of this up. But we have, a, 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 up to, we have 16 communities now that are part of our Canadian Coast Guard Auxiliary. So uh, again, there, uh, there's some infrastructure involved. It's basically most of them, or many of them, have acquired a boat through a grants and contributions program with the federal government. Uh, but those communities as well are, are becoming increasingly part of our marine uh, search and rescue system in the north. So if I can move to the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about where we're going in the future and just a, a couple of things that, that will influence this conversation. So this map shows you uh, some what we call low impact shipping corridors. They are historically meant, uh, they, I guess they were kind of first devised by simply looking at where ships go today. And the idea being that the north is so vast and so huge that if the Canadian government was going to make further investment that we would want to we want to put those investments where they, we kind of get the most bang for our buck. And that is where most of the traffic is going today. And so the Corridors Project is something that we're doing in partnership with Transport Canada. Uh, over the last year, we have uh, traveled to many places in the north and had conversations with northerners around not only what a governance model might look like, like how we with, with Inuit and northerners may uh, actually kind of co-manage or make decisions together on, on the future of corridors and investments in infrastructure, but also what are some of the specific priority areas that northerners think that the Canadian government should focus their investments to start. So, so that's a kind of one of the key projects. The, the next one for which I don't have a slide uh, is the Arctic region. So you may have noted Jessica talked about uh, that I'm the assistant commissioner for the Arctic region. And this is in fact a new thing. Over the past many years, we've been operating in a three region model. So basically east, central and west. And what we decided as an organization is that we needed to have an increased focus on the Arctic. So the idea, as you might imagine, is that my colleagues who are kind of sitting in St. John's, Montreal and Victoria have a lot of other things on their mind other than the Arctic. And so they all have had a piece of the Arctic, but nobody was actually at a senior level thinking about the Arctic full time in our context. The creation of the Arctic region is meant to change that. And over time, we, we certainly see uh, increased investment, but that's something, of course, we're going to have to work with, with partners on, uh, with northerners and ultimately the government. And I guess the last piece I'll leave you with is what you see here, which is uh, the fleet side. So uh, a lot of the infrastructure conversation for us is going to kind of revolve around the non-Coast Guard fleet uh, aspects. A bit of a different conversation than perhaps in the U.S. at this point. 
We've been very fortunate that in the, the last year or so, uh, the Canadian government has made significant multi-multi-billion dollar announcements for us to essentially replace our aging fleet. So I'll just highlight a couple of those on the top. The Polar Icebreaker, which was uh, an icebreaker that's been designed and funded for some time, in fact, just not yet constructed, is, uh, is meant to operate in the Canadian Arctic nine months a year. And that will be a ship that uniquely operates in the, in the Canadian Arctic. Unlike all the other icebreakers where the intention would be they operate in the, the north and the south, sorry, the north in the summer, and then in the south in the winter. The, uh, the next set, the program icebreakers, so those are the six program icebreakers that would essentially replace what are our heavy and medium icebreakers. So those are really the workhorses of, of our icebreaking fleet. Like I said, they're the ones that keep the St. Lawrence River and the Great Lakes open in collaboration with our U.S. Coast Guard counterparts. And they're the ones that operate in the north to help with the community resupply. The multi-purpose vessels, so we've uh, been uh, given money to build up to, si well in fact it says up to, but to build 16 multi-purpose vessels. The history of the Canadian Coast Guard is such that a lot of the investments kind of come piecemeal. So a lot of our ships are, are different than each other. They all do slightly different things. We want to move in a direction where we have a class of fleet. It's easier to maintain. It's easier to crew them. And all of these ships will have a light ice breaking capability, meaning in today's climate, they could break ice in the, the low Arctic in the summer, perhaps not the high. But of course, with climate change, that might evolve and change. We've also been given money for two Arctic and offshore patrol vessels. The Navy has already been funded for six of those vessels. We will get two variants at the end, so essentially the seventh and eighth vessel also adding to our fleet. So I'm going to stop there, but all that to say that for us, all of this uh, is, a, is a significant investment. It's going to give us more icebreaking capacity than we have today. And perhaps most importantly, knowing ships will, you know, these ships are likely to be around for 40, 50 years. They're built so that uh, we, can, we can evolve. And if there's a changing mandate or changing climate, that there'll be some flexibility built into to the, the, the specific missions they can deliver. So with that, Jessica, I'll hand it back to you. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, well, let's move over the border a bit. Um, and um, we'll have Mead Treadwell give a few remarks. And I guess I'll just put you uh, the one your one of your nine hats on. Um, and I think Mead's going to be talking a lot from the work he's been doing with the um, Arctic Circles Mission Council on shipping and ports. Um. Well, thank you, Jessica. And I, you know, it's it, grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. It's fun to listen to the Canadian Coast Guard talk about how well, uh, how well you're doing on uh, replenishing the fleet. And uh, I can tell you the first uh, time I ever set foot on, a, on an icebreaker that wasn't a Russian icebreaker, it was the Louis Saint Laurent, as we were sending them off to the North Pole with the Russians uh, in 1994. And uh, uh, I, I also pushed uh, to get the US-Canada uh, cooperation on joint mapping of the Arctic, and we've done tremendous work there together, too. Um, at the Wilson Center, we picked up a program that we started at the uh, Arctic Circle in 2015, which <coughs> simply asked the question, if we have a new ocean, if we have a newly accessible ocean, how are we going to pay for the infrastructure that's necessary for that ocean? Now, I'll tell you, Russia has a plan. Russia's plan is use their route, use their mandatory uh, 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 escort service with their icebreakers, pay half a million dollars to get across the Arctic Ocean and uh, save 40% of your transit time between East Asia and Northern Europe. Very simple plan. Uh, to put that a little bit in an economic context, uh, 18,000 vessels use the Suez Canal. Uh, a Russian study done by a global consulting firm uh, suggested that maybe 2,000 of those ships might divert, or the cargoes on 2,000 of those ships might recognize the benefits of the Arctic Ocean. 2,000 vessels uh, paying $500,000 uh, uh, $500, a trip is a billion dollars. Cash flow of a billion dollars will pay for a lot of icebreakers. So the concept that President Grimson of Iceland asked me to look at as head of a mission council for shipping and ports was could we internationalize Arctic seaways, not to, not to impinge it all on the standing disagreement we have about sovereignty, but, uh, and, and I'm very serious about that, uh, because we have a standing disagreement uh, on sovereignty with the Russians as well, 
And I dare say that Canada has interest for free seas other places in the world, but I'll just hush. Uh, but but uh, what we simply said was, is there a way that we could come up with an international seaway concept that perhaps is modeled on the St. Lawrence where we basically govern a sovereign waterway together, or a joint sovereign waterway together, but we offer a reliable service. And this all builds upon three words that Senator Dan Sullivan and I earlier in our careers got into the U.S. Arctic policy which said we want to see Arctic maritime shipping that's safe, secure, reliable. So whichever route you may think works for whatever good reason, to, for these routes to happen properly, you need aids to navigation, you need search and rescue, you need ports of, uh, 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 you need ports of refuge, you need uh, 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 towing capacity if, if people have problems, and frankly, in, in the same way that a covered wagon might have crossed the, uh, you know, might have crossed from Missouri to Oregon, uh, sometimes you need a cavalry detachment every 30 or 40 miles, and sometimes you need somebody who is the cavalry to join with you, depending on the ice conditions in this case. You either need an escort or you don't need an escort, but you need somebody who can come bail you out if you get in trouble. And so the general estimate that we came up with this uh, said let's, let's uh, create a U.S. corporation like we did with the St. Lawrence to go make deals with other countries to offer a service in the Arctic. And again, to try to transcend the question, it's not sovereignty, it's not like the U.S. wants to make money in your Canadian Northwest Passage. It's that if we are going together to offer safety, let's offer a revenue model that works, that can help finance what we need. And I don't know about you, uh, your Coast Guard, but my Coast Guard is, uh, you know, like, like the Navy told me at one point when we were helping them get Aegis cruisers for, for missile defense, they said, well, we don't really want to drive in circles. We're an expeditionary force. The Coast Guard will remind you that assisting I navigation for ICE is one of many different missions that they have. And so getting a stream of revenue may also ultimately support additional private icebreakers. So next slide. Uh, our, our three basic goals were safety, security, and reliability. And basically, could we, uh, could we put forward a business plan that with maybe 200 ships or $100 million a year uh, covers some basic needs to offer reliability across the Arctic Ocean? And this is not to give the back of our hand to the Northwest Passage. It, 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 that, that is something that, that, frankly, I think we should look at together. But should we, could we stimulate a dialogue? The reaction around the world has been rather interesting. Uh, we've had positive response from parliamentarians in Japan, parliamentarians in China, Korea. Uh, the Prime Minister of Norway kind of said, well, I'd sure like it if those ships just came without any help from us whatsoever. But uh, yeah, it probably makes sense to, to work together when we briefed her on this last spring. Uh, a parliamentary group in London has looked at it, the insurance industry has looked at it and has given us kind words that says, yeah, you may not be able to require use of your system by international law, but we can require use of your system uh, under best practices. We worked with the insurance industry to create the best practices <coughs> forum within pain. So the concept is out there. Next slide. Uh, uh, last year, Senator Murkowski uh, with Senator Sullivan, Senator King from Maine, and in a later version of the legislation, Senator Cantwell from Washington, and uh, Senator Wicker from Mississippi, sponsored bipartisan legislation. The first version was to create this corporation to go flange up with other shipping authorities and other nations. The second version, watered down, basically creates a federal advisory committee to help the Secretary of Transportation go do that anyway. And that Federal Advisory Committee Act has now passed uh, the Senate Commerce Committee, it's kind of teed up to be tied to whichever bill is likely to pass the Senate floor. I testified on it uh, in hearings uh, before the House Transportation Committee last spring, and we'll see. But the general concept is this. Can we work together to develop a revenue source that will help pay for some of the infrastructure so that all those bankers who were sitting up here 20 minutes ago can help, uh, help finance that? And it's, uh, it's a little bit beyond what the Arctic Council has wanted to think about. It's, it's a little bit above the pay grade of some, some of the discussions to begin actual commitment type discussions in, in, in East Asia. But I believe it's a discussion that we need to have. And I'll just close by saying this. The 
Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Next slide. The, the Russians right now, what's happening with Arctic tonnage in the Arctic Ocean is mostly LNG. There have been 14 of these tankers built that are carrying 16 and a half million tons either east or west from Yamal, and the Russians already have commitments to more than double that right now from Japan and Korea. Uh, I could play you the little movie of the Norilsk Nickel ship, which is running year round doing this. I can tell you that I'm now chairman of a company uh, that is buying five of these tankers and trying to do this off the north slope of Alaska. And we've actually made the offer to the government of the Northwest Territories, the last government, uh, to, to work together on doing this out of the NWT. There is a product in the north that will actually probably help pay for the infrastructure of Arctic shipping. And I just wanted that to be out there as part of this discussion as well. So uh, I'll just leave it at this. Uh, there was a new ocean around the time I was a kid. In 1961, Yuri Gagarin circled the Earth. John Glenn circled the Earth. Um, and an English science fiction writer named Arthur C. Clarke had written a paper in 1945 that said, you know, if you stick a satellite at 22,000 miles out there, the period of the orbit of that satellite is exactly the same time it takes the Earth to turn. And if you did that, we could have television between the constant continents instantly. Now, who was going to do that? The United States created a law, a company called ComSat. And it said, here's a little bit of money. Go diplomatically with the State Department to other ministries of post and telecom around the world. Sign them up. And we, the US government, who is in the missile making business, uh, will, will put those satellites in, in that orbit. And essentially what we're arguing today is with a new ocean to, to uh, convene cooperation, create a company or an effort to go do that. The US and Canada could do that together. And there's all sorts of arguments on how much shipping do you want, Nike doesn't want to send its sneakers across the Arctic, you know, whatever. All I can say is I would much rather, it's an open ocean, everybody can come. I would much rather it be safe, secure, reliable, and that we have a way to pay for it. Thank you. Excellent. Great. Whole host of questions already brewing. Um, <laughs> I'm going to turn it over now. Uh, to Peter Garapik. Um, he's the director for industry relations at Quark Expedition, um, probably because in his former life he wore um, um, a Coast Guard hat and so has a lot to offer um, um, Quark Expeditions. Um, and I'll just really quickly put a plug in and, and actually a new uh, board member for Arctic 360. So we're very happy to have him um, and very happy to get now the, uh, the tourism industry. All right. Well, it's good to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Jessica. <clears throat> So I'm going to first tell a bit about the industry. I'm not sure how many people know about it, but it's uh, quite a successful industry in the north and the south, Arctic and Antarctic, and Quark Industry is, sorry, Quark Expedition is one of those players in both, both poles. Some people call us bipolar, uh, especially, <laughs> but that's what happens. Um, you can see that the folks here are, are dressed for the, the weather, and um, th that's a good point as we talk about infrastructure and, you know, how do you see the Arctic? Well, these people are ready to crawl out and into a zodiac. They're ready to, you know, march up a, a beach and, and see stuff. So they're not looking for a lot of luxury when they go to the Arctic. But that's on the, on the ship they certainly are, but not when they go ashore. So the lack of infrastructure doesn't really phase the, uh, the passengers, maybe until something happens. So let's go to the next slide. So just a real quick, here's a bunch of vessels that you see in the Arctic. And now on the top uh, right of this picture, you'll see IECO. IECO is the... Um, Arctic Expedition Cruise Operators Association. And uh, they represent about 70 members, we're one of them. But this is the type of vessel you see. They are kind of older looking, some of them, uh, but that's about the size. You're looking at about 300 people, maybe 200 to 400, but the most are about 250, 300. So they're not big and they kind of a niche uh, industry, uh, but pretty successful. Uh, then let's, next slide then. Now, check this out. You can see that uh, it's been going on and very successful in other parts of the world. It's kind of what we're talking about, everywhere but Canada. You look at the numbers in Iceland, you look at the numbers in Svalbard, way, way up north in Svalbard, and I think, uh, Jessica, you were saying earlier how the Norwegians, a small country, or was it surely, I'm not sure, small country, 
but uh, lots and lots of infrastructure. So uh, Svalbard certainly has that. The Franz Joseph land is even further, farther up, and that's Russian. But look at Canada, the numbers. And if you look at the numbers in the west of Canada, it says 1,200. Well, this was from a couple years ago, and you might remember the Crystal Serenity went through with about mm, 1,200 passengers. So that's one ship going through. That was an anomaly, and she just did two trips two years in a row, but that's, uh, that's the numbers there. You can also see the numbers in the west is about uh, uh, 5,000. Okay, that's the entire cruise industry for Canada, of everybody operating, so it's pretty small. And I would say there's lots of potential there. Next slide. So you saw the older ships, and this is what's happening now. Quark industry is about to get this ship out of the shipyard. And uh, a few years ago, the, the stat was that 26 ships were in construction across the world in all the shipyards for this industry. They're going to be about this size, 200, 300 people. They're going to be very, very modern, uh, very efficient, very environmentally uh, sound, ice capable, uh, everything you want to bring the industry that much uh, further into the, the, the current uh, modern age of, of transportation, luxury, and able to get accessibility to various places. So this is what's coming. And uh, this is what wants to come to Canada. Next slide. So again, this is an interesting slide if you look at. This is Quark's uh, product. We call them products, the different voyages we do. And you can see that we're going all over the Arctic. We don't go that much to Canada. Other uh, companies do. Adventure Canada is one based here in Toronto that does a lot of Canadian work. But take a look at the Canadian routes, the green ones. And you notice um, for Quark, there's a dotted line that either leaves Toronto or Ottawa or Montreal. In this case, I think it's uh, Ottawa. And it goes to Greenland, where there's a really nice airport and a really nice pier. Or it goes to Resolute, where there's a really nice gravel runway of about two kilometers long. No pier, but at least they've got a, a, a hotel there. If you've ever been to Resolute Bay, it's uh, the Atco Hotel. It's a bunch of trailers and things put together. It's kind of neat, but it's got some capacity. So those are the two choices for Quark to bring people into or out of, out of Canada. So uh, you also notice that uh, um, Greenland gets pretty busy with cruise ships on the east and west coast. All right, next slide. So this is what I really want to talk about. We'd, we'd love to come north, but what happens when an expedition cruise ship wants to go north? Well, first of all, I did mention ports. There are none. There are places to pull in a safe havens, but there's really none. There's soon to be a Katowice and it's about to get its deep, uh, deep sea pier, and I think it's ahead of schedule, and everybody looks forward to that. But that's one location in the entire Arctic of about 50 communities on the water in the Arctic. One will have a pier, a modern pier. <clears throat> and it's not one that the, the, the cruise ships go too much. So if you don't have ports, you certainly don't have fuel availability. Nana Civic is a concept, and it's simply not going to be functional, I don't think, for anybody, uh, other than anybody commercial, non-D&D non and non-Coast Guard. So fuel, you have to be arranged, it's got to come in on ships, it's got to be bunkered on barges, ship-to-ship uh, -ship, uh, transfers. Not always easy, and certainly not cheap. There's no shipyards, there's no uh, hollow, there's no tech, there's nothing like that in the Arctic. Um, charts, we own all charts, are limited, so uh, Neil mentioned corridors, stay on the corridors. But guess what? Cruise ships don't want to stay on the corridors. They want to go to that back, back port, that back uh, fjord or somewhere. So it's uh, challenging to do that. Um, I certainly can talk to SAR, and I'm not going to badmouth SAR, because that's what I was doing for the past few years, but let's talk about it for a second and realize that helicopters are coming from the south. If someone has to medevac, if someone has to come off a beach, a ship, the winching capability has to come from the south. And that's a, a, a cormorant helicopter that's going to take 12 hours, two crews, 24 hours to get north. That's not a very effective way to, to save lives, be it commercial fishing, com uh, cargo, or, or passenger for that matter. Um, uh, the, the Coast Guard aux uh, auxiliaries there, Neil mentioned that, the icebreakers are there. Uh, they can get there, but it's certainly not what Meade de described on the, the Northern Sea Route, the, what the Russians have done. So there's certainly issues we look at in terms of port, in terms of safety. Um, I should mention too, in Svalbard, uh, you saw the, the chart up there, lots of cruise activity in Svalbard. They do have a, a, a fee that the uh, cruise ships pay so that they have two uh, Super Puma helicopters on standby all the time. And that's for the fishers, that's for the cargo, and that's for passengers. But that's what uh, a fee that the industry happy to pay, and it really uh, boosts the, uh, the, the safety aspect. They are going to be uh, medevacs. Um, a lot of these people on our cruises are older and they may slip and fall, but they have to be fit to climb in and out of that Zodiac, no matter where they go. Uh, on the medical side, hospitals, we all know there's very little, okay? Uh, recent medevacs have brought people either a Callowit and then south, or Yellowknife and then south. 
and that's got to be by helicopter if it's going to be timely. And again, is it a winch helicopter, or is it a helicopter that lands and then takes off from an airport, but then you have to get, have to get that passenger, that, that, that uh, patient, to that airport. Um, and then we talk about tourism for a second. We talk about what we're used to down here, airports with baggage carousels and, and places to sit and relax with restaurants. We talk about hotels. We talk about restaurants. The big issue in the north is if there is an incident or if you want to bring people in, say, to Resolute or any other place, there are no hotels. There are no restaurants. The terminal airports aren't big enough to hold everybody. The runways are short. They're usually gravel, so you're restricted to ATR 42s or Dash 8, so only a few of your passengers come in at a time on many planes. So operating in Canada, within Canada, is really difficult because getting the passengers in and out. That's why you see that a lot of operations pick up people in Greenland, bring them into Canada, and then drop them off in Greenland. Very strange, isn't it? Um, the other uh, number, uh, word I have up here is government, and I could go in depth in here. Um, whenever we, the industry, wants to go into the Arctic, we need to get our permits, and that's permits for uh, ship uh, capabilities, for the people on board operating the ship, uh, the temporary labor who are working within Canada if you're working from port to port in Canada. Uh, it's all about all the environmental, and I have the state. Um, I know Neil and Joanne, who's with us here from Coast Guard, and myself, We've always, always heard the message of environment, environment, environment. And we've heard today that this is not always the people who talk about environment and the walls. But uh, just last week, I was at a Canadian Wildlife Service uh, Area Co-Management Committee uh, group in Chars in Cambridge Bay. And uh, they are the people we will have to permit to if we want to go anywhere near a, a migratory bird uh, sanctuary or na a national wildlife area. And they are ready to say no. Why I was there is to build a relationship, start the communication, say we do things incredibly environmentally minded. We have ships that can do uh, you know, things very safely. Uh, we'd like to get a permit. But we're going to have to get a permit from TC, Transport Canada. We're going to get a permit from Parks. We're going to get a permit from CWS and from the regional Inuit associations. And these are all new permits that pop up and cost per pop up. And in fact, last year, one came from the uh, uh, Kikitani in, uh, uh, Inuit Association and a fee of um, $25 a head if you were going to go on land. And that wasn't just for passengers, but a crew or anybody else. O to the blue. And that's very hard to define your, your profit uh, model if this comes out of the blue the, the year you're about to operate. So this is a real challenge for us is to navigate through the permit process but also afford it. It all gets passed on to the, the, the passenger, so it also makes Canada either affordable or not compared to others. I should also mention with Greenland, uh, they have a one window in. No matter where you want to go, what you want to do, you submit your tour itinerary to that one window in, all the permitting is done, all the paperwork's done, and you're given a fee and you pay it. Wow, wouldn't that be great? But we have so many different levels, again, federal, territorial, and Inuit associations that we have to deal with. So right here, the, the next uh, line there is uh, risk, oh, no, backslide, but the risk mitigation. How do we deal with all these things? So in terms of safety, very high standards with the International Maritime Organization, Transport Canada as well. All the vessels meet these standards. Very smart guidelines from IECO. I learned after getting into this industry, although I was familiar with IECO and also its counterpart in the South IATO, that those guidelines that these associations hold are extremely stringent. They expect all members to follow those to the T. And in fact, I'm now on two committees on the South and the North, and it's uh, compliance and dispute resolution. If you do not abide by every word of those guidelines, you're out or you're, uh, you're going to be uh, some sort of a resolution. So they're not regulations, but these, uh, these uh, associations have a lot of weight. Um, training. Uh, the crews definitely have tr uh, tabletop exercises, live exercises, working with the folks in Coast Guard. Crystal Serenity, when she came through, had a U.S. Coast Guard-led one, then a Canadian Coast Guard-led one. We worked all together. So they're really well informed. Uh, I could quickly bring up uh, Academic IOFI. The vessel went on the rocks a couple years ago, uh, going slow into an uncharted area. The reason it works so well, there were no casualties, no issues, and everybody got off that ship and onto a sister ship, is because the owner at that time had gone through TTXs and learned how the process worked and spoke the language, and we all worked as one. That's what has to happen. But the last word I have up there I think is really important is avoidance. You avoid the ice. You avoid the uncharted areas. You avoid poor infrastructure where there's no ports. You avoid where there's too many fees and too much uh, time spent on permitting. And then what you do, you avoid Canada. 
And that's what a lot of us are looking at, is if it keeps on getting bad, if it doesn't get better, if the environmental walls go up, and that we really want to get there and see these things, then we won't come. And uh, someone mentioned it, and it's a really important part of the whole tourist industry. The people who are paying to come want to make a difference. They go home with a new message, and that's part of what Quark does and other operators do is you've seen it, you've seen the Arctic, you've seen what can happen here, but it's happening everywhere. Go home and say, how can we better be better to protect this entire planet, not just the poles? And that's what we try to impart. Last slide, and we were asked to talk about this, about what would it be like to go from Greenland to Canada to uh, the Alaska to the U.S.? Um, not that hard when it comes to passing borders with customs and, and immigration. We're used to that. Um, maybe a little tricky when it, when it comes to permitting. I mentioned that already. You're going to have to get permits. I don't think you can streamline that. We have to take a, a lesson from Greenland that does this really well. But then there's something called cabotage. It's, it's every country has it, the Jones Act in the States. And it means if a foreign ship wants to go from one port in one country to another port in another, that same country with a cargo, it can't. That's supposed to be for American ships in America, Canadian ships in Canada, and, and, and Greenland, Danish ships in Greenland. So if you're going to do that, then you're going to have to pay a lot of fees, and, and et cetera. So that's why another reason that we, Quark, leave one country, come into Canada, and go back. However, with this new ship we're building, we want to operate in Canada. The permits aren't so bad for the ship, and not so bad for the people, but it comes back to permitting where we want to go will be a challenge. I'll close with the next slide. Um, we want to be here. We want to make it happen. We employ people. Uh, we want to make uh, it uh, good for the locals. I should say, why is it good for the locals? Sure, they can become guides. We'd love to see them come out of the Nunavut Fisheries Marine Training Consortium School and be on the deck uh, as officers or in the engine room. Uh, it helps the economies of small communities when we go in. Sure, there's arts and crafts that we buy. Uh, but IECO uh, has also started a, a program where interns are trained and hired and they work on the ships, not just here and there, they become employees on the ships in the Antarctic and the Arctic, full employees, and they're paid as interns. So we really do want to make a difference and uh, the challenges are there and we'll see if moving forward we can work together and, and uh, make it happen. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I guess we could say your takeaway is uh, build it and they will come. The problem is how, <laughs> and, um, and um, also about permitting. And I'll just pick up for a second and on my way to introduce um, Matthew, is that um, Neil and Matthew, you were a part of it. Um, we, we put together uh, an Arctic workshop, a shipping workshop last March, and we're gonna have another one in April. And it's actually to try to have a, um, you know, a conversation, I would say almost in-house, on a lot of these issues and sorting through, um, thinking through this infrastructure challenge, how we're gonna find financing, um, and what mechanisms might be there. And so, but there's a lot we can pick up on, but a big piece of that and where it was great to have um, um, the Canadian um, Bureau of Marine Underwriters, Marine Insurance Underwriters there um, is they bring a, they're, they're a critical piece to this. And so we're gonna let Matthew. Yeah, thank you. I, I, and I'd like to start off by saying thank you both Jessica and, and Arctic 360 generally. Um, it's a real privilege for me to be invited to be part of this discussion, uh, even on a personal level. It's just so, such a fascinating time to be uh, engaging in discussions about what's happening in the North. So much change is going on, uh, and, we're, and we're all trying to figure out how to deal with that change. Um, I, I'm here today, just as Jessica mentioned, uh, on behalf of the Canadian Board of Marine Underwriters. We are a non-profit organisation that is, is basically designed to help promote uh, marine insurance uh, as a, an industry for people to work, uh, as uh, educational opportunities for the people that do work in the industry, and in our relationship with the wider community, both Arctic 360 and the work we do with Transport Canada, um, and the Marine Lawyers Association of Canada as well. So you're all sitting there thinking, oh no, I have to listen to the insurance guy now for the next five or 10 minutes, and this is 10 minutes of my life I will never get back. <laughs> so I will promise to keep it short, um, but yeah, it is gonna be a little bit, uh, a little bit, <coughs> a little bit dry compared to some of these other uh, topics. But I thought I'd start by saying, I looked at the, the topic, financing the infrastructure gap. So for me, that, that really led to the question, well, does insurance have a role in financing? And do people know what, insurance is in terms of uh, shipping in the Arctic. So I thought perhaps if I start there uh, and just, just give you a little bit of uh, information about what 
uh, marine insurance is with, with regards to shipping. So if, in a nutshell, unless insurance is in place, the banks will not invest their capital. Uh, ship and cargo owners won't put their assets at risk. And Transport Canada won't allow the vessel to actually transit the Arctic. So unless you can produce blue cards that prove that you have enough insurance for any kind of pollution event or wreck removal, uh, should something go badly wrong, uh, you simply aren't allowed to transit in the Arctic. Um, so we do have a role. So the kind of insurance that is provided, I, I really sort of broke it down into, um, it's really two areas, but I've got four headings. So cargo insurance is, is simply that. It's, uh, it's first party property insurance on whatever commodity is being moved through or to, uh, in this case, the Arctic. And that's provided traditionally by uh, local insurance companies in Canada, um, part of the Canadian Border Marine Underwriters, um, or um, quite often Lloyds of London. Uh, that's a global insurance market based in London. And uh, usually the decision is made wherever the cargo owner is located. So if this is an import of uh, you know, project <coughs> cargo for an infrastructure <coughs> project in Iqaluit, if, if the, uh, the company that's investing in that infrastructure project is based in Germany, then the purchasing decision for, for the cargo insurance will most likely be done in Germany as well with local German insurers uh, or, or Lloyds. So who the insurance company is on a piece of cargo at any particular given time and place generally, generally is based on where the owner of that cargo sits. Then you have um, the next three, which are all different elements of ship insurance. So you've got the hull, that's the physical ship itself. Uh, then you have loss of hire. So if, if a vessel gets stuck in, um, in ice and, and cannot trade because it's stuck there for six months, somebody has to pay for that because that lost trading opportunity is lost revenue dollars and that, uh, that will put a company out of business unless they have that insurance policy in place. And then probably the one that's of most interest um, is liability to third parties. So that's traditionally, it's a bit like your, your automobile. You know, if you hit somebody, they want to be reimbursed for the damage that you've done to them. Um, with a vessel, if you sink that vessel in somebody's backyard, they expect you to come along and remove it. And if that vessel spills fuel oil, uh, because of its, it carries fuel oil to generate power to allow the vessel to move, or if it's containing fuel oil as a resupply for northern communities, or if it's simply carrying gas or oil transiting through the Northwest Passage, again, if that fuel oil or that uh, gas or that diesel or whatever it is spills into the environment and it damages uh, beaches, it damages fishing rights, it damages people's rights of enjoyment, ancestral rights, whatever that is, all of that has to be cleaned up, all of that has to be paid for and all of those interested parties have to be compensated. And so that's, that's an insurance policy that's part of this as well. And that's traditionally provided by what we call P&I clubs p &I stands for Protection and Indemnity. It's a form of third-party liability insurance. And it's, it's basically on the principle of a pool. So everybody that has a vessel that is insured by that p &I club contributes um, <coughs> funds into that club. And then from those funds, the, the money is drawn out to pay claims. Uh, and those are mostly based in London and in Nordic countries. Um, so, to give you an idea, it's a, it's a very international business, but there are centres in which uh, marine insurance is based. London and Nordic countries are massive, New York increasingly big, uh, Singapore traditionally has been a, a centre as well, as has Hamburg in Germany. So, um, when you look at the Canadian insurers 
potential role as financing in infrastructure in Canada, um, I thought it was important to actually explain that that's probably not going to be a, a source of funds purely on a mathematical basis. Our entire marine insurance market in Canada is roughly 300 US million dollars, uh, which sounds like a lot of money, but when you realize that we run at a 95% combined ratio, that means we make a 5% profit, and you can do the maths. It's not a huge, a huge sum at the end of the day. So in answering that sort of fundamental question that is the heading of this topic, no, the Canadian insurance industry will not be financing infrastructure projects in the Canadian Arctic. However, we go back to where we started, you cannot ship in the Arctic without insurance. So as a facilitator of shipping in the Arctic, absolutely, I think we have a role. And, you know, that role can be to put terms and conditions on a policy to say that, you know, during these months of the year, you will not trade or travel or transit in the, in these, outside of these areas. So you can restrict where a vessel is allowed to trade through, through an insurance policy, and that's, uh, that, that's common. Um, to have navigating areas on a, on a marine insurance policy, particularly a, a hull policy. Um, when we look at what we were discussing with regards to some kind of northern seaway authority, for want of a better term, um, absolutely that's of interest to insurers because anything that helps to reduce the risk that is involved with navigating in that area, whether that's improving charts and navigation aids or uh, the sort of thing that Russia does with the icebreaker convoys, um, putting in place sort of rescue and uh, search and rescue operations, putting in place the ability to clean up a spill if something goes wrong, um, safe harbours, points of refuge for crew members and passengers, uh, training of seafarers, all of those things help to influence the risk and obviously as underwriters we're very interested in trying to um, calculate what that risk is when we're setting the terms and the conditions and the premiums of the policy. And I think that's, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of other interested parties that fall into this. You know, insurers, we look to all kinds of different places to, to garner bits of information to help us with, with trying to understand things and trying to make those decisions. Because at the, at the end of the day, we're taking our corporation's money and making an educated bet on a risk and on a venture. And we need to do that multiple times a day, a week, a month, a year, uh, and hope at the end of the year that we've done that in, in a way that actually gives us that 5% margin that we're, we're looking for. So we look at P&I clubs, we look at classification societies, which are the, the people that set the rules for vessels. So if you have a vessel it has to be registered in a particular country. That country will have a classification society that will have inspection regimes, will have rules and regulations about crewing, about uh, how the vessel is essentially run. Um, we'll be talking amongst ourselves as Canadian insur insurers, but we're also a part of the International Union of Marine Insurers, which is, a, is a, basically a Canadian board of marine underwriters on steroids for the whole world. And we go to their conferences and we... we talk to each other and we learn from each other. And then we take the guidance from Transport Canada and the Coast Guard. Um, and, you know, of interest to us at the moment is that you cannot, if I understand correctly, you cannot enter the Arctic unless you have the sign off from Coast Guard to do that. They need to know where you're going to be. They need to know what you're doing so that, again, if something goes wrong, they can come to help. Well, well those are the kind of um, protections that we look to um, and sorry, I meant to say, please pop on to the and just hit it one more time. Oh, I didn't realise we were going to do that. Yeah, there you go. Um, and this is, um, you know, an, an example of a vessel that trades in the Arctic uh, um, on a regular basis. It's insured uh, mostly in the Canadian insurance market, the Avatac. Um, you know, so, so this is going on, um, but I think ultimately getting comfortable with what those risks and exposures are is, is, is what we try to do as insurers. At the moment, I would say we're rather uncomfortable. Uh, there's, there's more unknowns than knowns. 
and um, particularly when you start talking about transiting the entire passage, you know, that's something which uh, there's not a lot of iterative da data that we can draw on uh, to take that data and project it forward and do our risk modeling. So uh, it's an interesting time, it's a difficult time, but ultimately uh, we talked about costs, you know, insurances is one, is one of those costs uh, that's particularly elevated for shipping in the Arctic and the more that can be done to help control the risks, help us to understand how those risks are controlled, then the less those costs will be and uh, perhaps the more competitive and the more uh, shipping there will be in the region. Great. Thank you so much. Um, this has all been really, um, this is a good starting point for, absolutely. Um, you know, so, you know, we hear um, from Matthew that, um, you know, a huge part of risk mitigation has to do with infrastructure. And the more infrastructure there is, um, the more you can mitigate um, um, risk. And um, for one, even for shippers, then so you can even be insured, but also then to bring down premium costs, right? So infrastructure right. is a key piece of this. And um, I think, you know, what we hear from Peter, it's um, um, pretty loud and clear that, you know, because of the lack of infrastructure, we're losing out on an economic opportunity um, that could be for Canada um, in terms of tourism. Um, and in fact, we're also falling behind our neighbors in, in, in trying to take advantage of those opportunities. And, um, and so when we listen to, to Mead's um, conversation, I think maybe part of this or a lot of it is also driven from the fact that it, um, the infrastructure deficit is so big in Alaska and the federal government is not going to be able to put up a lot of the infrastructure and ports um, that are necessary to have the safe and reliable um, packages <coughs> that you're talking about. And so you're looking to ways to bring people together and to cooperate and try to be able to um, um, work together to try to help come, you know, build infrastructure through some sort of mechanisms um, that could generate revenue. Um, and so I, um, I'd like maybe if, um, Neil, you can pick up a little bit on um, where you go deeper a little bit into where the expectation is um, from the Canadian federal government <coughs> for infrastructure financing to be built. Um, and um, and is it, do, you, do you think the, the federal government is going to be able to provide all of that? If not, um, how do we um, bring in the private sector? And is there, um, 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 do you see some opportunity in cooperating um, to try to help? Great mechanisms that would. Yeah. So, well, yes, Jessica. So maybe I'll just start with, um, you know, within my own mandate, our focus is very much on trying to, I guess, dig down a little deeper on what specifically is required, right? So I certainly agree with, you know, a lot of the comments that, uh, well, pretty much everything you, you said, Mead, around the infrastructure. You know, we need ports of refuge. We need to increase search and rescue, uh, environmental response capacity. And that's just not from our own perspective, but over the last year I've spent a lot of time uh, and my team has spent a lot of time and going back to Peter previously, uh, engaging with Inuit and Northerners and, and they're telling us the same thing, right? So I think that we can, we can all kind of violently agree that on what needs to get done and then it's the question of, of how, right? But before that, I get, you know, my mandate is to, is to figure out in detail, what do we need? So it's good to say, okay, we need a port and refuge, but through the corridors project, as an example, we're trying to identify with Inuit, where are the best places to, to, uh, to put those ports of refuge? And it may be that it is just an inlet and that there isn't actually infrastructure required because there may be a natural you know, uh, a place where, where ships, it, but we want to be able to put those on a map, right? So, so that's, I would just say, my focus. That being said, uh, and I'll s maybe share my, more, my, my opinions more from a personal level than uh, on behalf of my organization, but I think there are, uh, you know, does the federal government have the money to do it? Uh, I'll argue no, because uh, if they did, then likely we'd already have it all built. Right, and we see that uh, there, there's still uh, there's still a lack. Of course, all federal governments have to compete with with thousands of different funding requests and requirements on, on, a, on a myriad of issues, and this is but one of them. And so, uh, when we look at the the vastness of the North American Arctic, the requirements that are there, does a federal go can the federal government, you know, either Canada or the U.S., just do everything themselves? I suggest not. 
So I think that's where you know the idea of partnerships becomes very interesting. Uh, you know whether that's through a model uh, that raises fees, kind of like Russia's doing, uh, whether that's through um, looking and packaging infrastructure opportunities that could be leveraged for you know multiple reasons, not just shipping, but for other things that actually makes it attractive for the private sector to invest. Uh, I, I don't know. There are others who may. Uh, who know, may know better than I, but certainly, you know, from my perspective, yes, there's a requirement to look at a, a lot of different sources of funding and figuring out how do we make it attractive and interesting for different folks to want to put their money into, uh, into the investment. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a few questions I want to pick up on. One of them is um, I became quite fascinated, um, and, and I think there's a similar situation like what you were talking uh, about with Svalbard. Um, in my time living in, in Norway, I, I, I got to spend some time um, with the people organizing, basically. Um, um, and this has to do in terms of, I'm thinking, with uh, also creating better mechanisms for risk mitigation, but also emergency response, but also actually in providing some sort of revenue. Um, and so this goes over to the oil and gas industry, but I think you know you just take the concept itself and maybe see about its transferability. But so in um, in Norway, there's this this organization called NoFo, and um, it, itself as an organization, it's independent, but it also works directly with um, um, with the Coast Guard. And so basically, every offshore oil and gas operator um, along the Norwegian coast has to pay into this yearly this yearly fee that goes to NOFO. And basically what NOFO does is it trains fishers um, for emergency response and preparedness and response. It um, retrofits their boats so they can uh, have boom equipment on their boats. Um, it, pays, um, it pays them um, a small salary with the obligation that they always have to be within a certain um, a number of hours of being able to respond to an incident. Um, they do um, they do exercises year round, um, and um, and they even work with the local communities in establishing boom equipment and working on preparedness um, and response measures that way. And um, you know it also creates by as an institution and its collaboration with the government, it creates a really clear plan for how then all levels of government from the local community up through the Coast Guard um, work in collaboration and basically simultaneously respond. To an incident, and I don't, you know, you can almost say it's like outsourcing um, um, maybe some of the search and rescue pieces because what the Serenity ship did, you cannot have your <laughs> entire, you can't bring an entire, um, a tour, you know, like a 3,000 person ship and have an extra one just in case <laughs> riding next to you. That's not, that's not an option. And, and I'm just wondering, um, and maybe you could speak a little bit to the Svalbard piece, um, Peter, but like, could an established organization like this help with risk mitigation, provide funding for training communities, money to help allocate provisions, um, establish synergy between local communities and the Coast Guard, um, provide some possible revenue support? And I'm thinking, and is something like this attractive for the marine insurance industry in, in mm -hmm. having a, a, man, you know, a, a formalized entity which could help, um, help feed into that? And is this a good thing, or is this something like, oh my God, that's another cost, and now we're out of business? Right. <laughs> so there's a lot of things there, right. but I would like All right, I'll take a stab at this. Um, I think we don't like surprises, taxes, fees, or anything else, right? So this would definitely be a culture shift in a model. You know, we've got the establishment. It's pretty similar in the U.S. and, and Canada, uh, how the Coast Guard works. So this would be a culture shift. And I could say, though, with any of us, if we know we're going to go somewhere, say we're going on a vacation somewhere, and we're going to get the package deal. If I pay that package deal, I know I'm going to get a quality product, and I know it's going to cost this much, I'll pay it. It's better than going down and paying somebody this, that, that, or you know, getting a, a deal that doesn't come through. So it's a big culture shift that uh, everybody's got to buy into. But as I mentioned with Greenland, it's a one window in to get all your permits. If an organization such as the one I work for now is going to venture into, say, committing more trips in the Canadian Arctic, and we know the service is going to be this, 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 and this was the one package fee we're going to pay, yeah, sure, why not? We'll simplify it. Um, but there's a lot of nuts and bolts that go into that behind the scenes, right? So uh, that's, that's, what, that's what I would say. Yeah. Matthew, from uh Well, um, yeah, so there is uh, something kind of along those lines in Canada already. There's the Canadian Coast Guard Auxiliary, which uh, basically uh, fishing vessels uh, have this extra role where if somebody gets into distress, the fishing vessels will then be first responders. Uh, now, when you insure a fishing vessel, you're expecting it to work under certain parameters, 
if you're, in, if, you're, if you're then turning a fishing vessel into a search and rescue vessel, you're now running this vessel probably at full power until it actually gets to wherever it needs to go. You're, you're doing it regardless of the weather conditions because you're there to try and save, you know, search, search and rescue, save lives, etc. So there is a, a special insurance policy in place that actually recognises that and will reimburse the, uh, the, the, the fisher people uh, and, and the vessel owners should the vessel be damaged during the process of the search and rescue. So that's an example of where we can help as a facilitator by providing a product that will actually step in and say, yes, you know, this is a very valuable service. It's one that we actually benefit from as well. Uh, and so we'll put this product together and we'll reimburse you if something happens as a consequence of. Great. I'm going to go to Neil and then I'm going to go to me next. So, Neil, first of on, on, on that. Um. Yeah, well, well, I mean, uh, building on a bit what, what was said, I think that the, does the model exactly, but I mean, when we look at best practice in other countries, we don't typically always import the entire model, right? We look at the bits and pieces that make sense. So I think that uh, certainly paying money into a fund, you know, makes, makes uh, some money available for other things. In Canada, in the south, we do in fact charge fees to industry for ice breaking services and marine navigation services, not something we do in the north right now. So I, I would say, yes, there are bits and pieces of the model that make sense, but at the same time, we have a very robust search and rescue model in the north. There are things, I, I think, opportunities for improvement, but at the same time, uh, I don't think we, we would be on, on the page of wanting to completely outsource or go in a different direction. The other thing to be mindful of is, is that traditionally, we don't, we don't charge for search and rescue. Now that being said, um, outside of the marine world, there's been some changes where uh, recently Parks Canada has put in out west a fee if you wanna, if you wanna climb because there were getting to be too many search and rescue instances that were costing the Canadian taxpayers a lot of money. So, you know, does that evolve over time? I don't know. But, the, uh, but the, the logic behind it is that if you charge for search and rescue, people stop calling, they get into bigger trouble and, and you know, can pass away. And so that's why traditionally we haven't wanted to go down that path. So, so I think there are bits and pieces, like I said, that, that could be very interesting for us, but uh, perhaps uh, you know, their model evolved for a reason, ours has, and now it's maybe uh, implementing the best of that. And I think I want to kind of pick up then on, uh, in terms of this cross-border piece, right? And so um, obviously the Coast Guards, um, you know, have to work together in, in a certain capacity. And I'm just trying to understand um, and, and how it would be, you know, received by um, um, the marine in, uh, insurance industry. Um, what, what, what might there be in terms of mechanisms to have strengthened Coast Guard collaboration. Is there, a, you know, do you see an eye towards being able to have a way to generate some some revenue for the infrastructure that that you both Coast Guards fundamentally need <laughs> to, to do their job? I think I would make the argument that behind this, the what's called the Seal Act in the United States and and the uh, the, the follow-on advisory committee act that is trying to make this work is not necessarily to put the government in the continuous escort service business, uh, but it's more kind of a transitional thing. And I'll just gi give you a couple of examples. Uh, when I told the story about CompSat, about how our government went to 43 other governments in the world, said we'll guarantee and get satellites up there over the Indian, the Atlantic, and the Pacific, CompSat was actually uh, moved from being a publicly owned company to a privately owned company listed on Wall Street within 20 years, all right? And now the government does not necessarily put up satellites for telecommunications. But we said, we'll kind of guarantee that you make it work, develop the revenue, move on. I've been in a sailboat in Miami Harbor. Uh, the captain was not drinking, but we did run ashore, uh, you know, uh, not, uh, not in a life safety issue. and. Uh, we didn't call the Coast Guard, we called Tow US, or Boat US, who came for 50 bucks on our credit card, pulled us off the sandbar. And in the Gulf of Mexico, where there's a lot of oil rigs, for example, um, the Coast Guard is there to fly a, a medevac if it needs to, but every self-respecting oil rig has a helicopter on call on contract, and, uh, and you know that sort of thing. So, that I think the real question that we've got to ask ourselves is what's the transition measure that gets this up and going so that it's economic for, for everybody? And that, what kind of cooperation now? I'm proud of the cooperation that we've done in 
uh, in the Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment, in going to a mandatory polar code, in the PAIM, uh, the PAIM committee that the insurance industry you know, encouraged us to do, uh, the search and rescue agreement, the oil spill agreement, those are all good things. But just remember, those are rules, not resources. Right? We've got to foster a way to bring together the resources. Uh, but we also have to look at it as kind of a transitional exercise. There will come a time when salvers will be, do what salvers do in other oceans and have that capability. We don't have it today. And part of it is, is, is recognizing, you know, you, you mentioned uncharted areas. Uh, charting is an incredibly important thing. Uh, as we did the Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment, we heard lots of people uh, talk about absence of comms. Well, comms have gotten better and they're getting further better. And, you know, uh, several of us in the room who, you know, I, I work with Iridium, but uh, we're, watching, we're watching several of the LEO networks and that's getting there. Um, AIS is getting a lot better. In fact, Iridium uh, with a company down the road, with Harris and a company down the road called Exact Earth in Cambridge, Ontario, right now can tell you where pretty much every ship over 100 tons is in the world, uh, instantly. And, we, and so situational uh, awareness in, in the Arctic as well as every other ocean has, has improved. Uh, and I first started arguing for AIS after the Brer, a, a Norwegian vessel, hit the rocks in Shetland in the early 90s. The state of Alaska took that position of we've got to put a bell on the cat. So we are making improvements and I think the argument here is that to get over the transom, to, to get this started, uh, some sort of cooperative funding mechanism tied to a revenue mechanism is necessary. But it doesn't have to last forever. I might make one comment too. You talked about the transition. Um, if if a, somebody, an entity, is going to pay into a fund, they shouldn't have to pay for um, the response, just paying the fund and know that the response is always going to be there. Paying the fund, know that the icebreaker is there or the tug. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so it, it shouldn't be uh, just uh, help create the system. And when you enter the, the toll highway or the seaway, you know those services are there as you go. And it would replace, as Neil says, there are fees in the south for icebreaking aids navigation. They don't exist in the north now, but um, part of the transition, package it and, and sell it. I, I, I would say that. <coughs> Some of the services you wouldn't have to pay for, but I think your insurance would have to pay for some of the consequences of things going wrong. Uh, I, I can't imagine that the fund would be big enough to, to, to deal with, with, with some of those consequences because the fees would be too big and it just wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't fly. So um, spill response, sir, response, the insurer could help pay for that? Well, I, you know, I think that's part of the reason why you buy insurance, and it's part of what Transport Canada requires in terms of evidence <coughs> of insurance, is that somebody's going to come along with a big checkbook at the end of the day and, and help finance the clean-up and the uh, removal. Uh, but I think in terms of the search and rescue of people, perhaps, or some of the other elements, uh, the prov provision of better charting and uh, navigational aids and things like that. May, maybe the establishment of a, of a very defined shipping corridor that is perhaps uh, not a dedicated escort per vessel, but maybe it's something like they do in, in times of uh, high piracy or high uh, terrorism activities, they will create a shipping corridor and then they will police that corridor. You know, maybe there's a a version of that that could apply with instead of policing but uh, you know Coast Guard support. Uh, there are a number of different ways to go at it but until it, it, it's that chicken and egg until you have the demand for the traffic you can't generate the fees and you can't pay for the infrastructure so, so that's that dilemma that we're struggling with. Yeah maybe there's a couple of thoughts so um, you know, what, what comes to, to, to my attention is when Peter talked about the, the window, the one window shopping that Greenland has as opposed to the, in, in Canada. And so, you know, as a federal government, and, and others may not always see it this way, but we certainly would look at, you know, if we wanted to charge something that, well, what can we give in return, right? And so I, 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 ha I, I see personally an opportunity to say, well, if somehow we could move towards a uh, one window. I can only imagine Quark and every other company, the amount of resources that you have to put into navigating the, the various bureaucracies. And if we were somehow able to 
um, streamline that, then perhaps the costs that the companies are actually paying for to navigate that could then be redirected to infrastructure, whether it's through a fee or whatever. So the company's not necessarily out of pocket, uh, but at the same time they're getting something. The other thing I would add is that, uh, you know, kind of what Meet said in, the, in I guess, a transitory uh, type fee, there is precedent in Canada where in the 1970s we set up, we, we set up the, the ship oil pollution fund. And the intention there is that basically if there is a, uh, a, a ship source oil disaster in Canadian waters, that there's a fund that essentially that goes above and beyond, um, you know, what, what could the insurance may pay out or others to, to, to clean up and make whole all of those parties that are impacted by it. But the history of that fund is such that we collected it as Canada for several years in the 70s. We have, we do pay out of it regularly, but not as much as the interest that's earned on the principal. And so since that time, in fact, there hasn't been any collective fees for, for decades. Yeah, so about there's some one, kind of a historic... There's uh, about $1.8 billion sitting in there right now. Uh, and actually, Transport Canada is just about to publish a paper, or, or not a paper, but a, a, almost an advertisement for this fund. Uh, to, to make people more aware of it because it's not being really utilised. But, that, but there's a, the insurance will pay prior to that, a call, a call on that fund. But, but where it is very useful is where there's a, a pollution incident, the vessels disappeared over the horizon and nobody actually can figure out, well, who caused that pollution? And that's where the fund, I think, has been most useful. Um, I don't know, I just have a, a question I'm thinking. Um, there's a lot of, um, I lived in Iceland for two years, but there's a lot of effort between Iceland and Greenland to um, increase and improve their um, tourism cooperation through shipping, um, like shipping tourism. Um, and I'm wondering if there's, um, you know, an interest, you know, in Alaska and the Canadian North, um, maybe Peter, you would know, but, um, you know, on trying to, um, if there's any interest on forming some sort of, um, or if they're informal collaborations on, uh, you know, shipping tourism between Alaska and Canada, and I'm even thinking between Canada and Greenland. Um. I would say the Canada-Greenland is, is just about to happen. Um, you look at the topography, the fjords, the landscape, it's beautiful, they're close to each other just across the Davis Strait. Mead, you probably know the northern slope better than I do, but I know that the north slope of Yukon is boring. Right? It's mm -hmm. flat, it's, uh, there's uh, very little water, and that goes right across the top of Alaska. The fun part of Alaska is down south, right, in Juneau or Anchorage and stuff. So that might be a challenge that is just not that exciting in the, the, the Beaufort out there, right? Well, I, and to that, I'm, I'm not going to criticize my geography, but uh, <laughs> uh, <coughs> no, I, uh, <coughs> I helped start a company called Siberia Alaska Trading Company in the 80s, or late 80s, early 90s that took close to 5,000 Quark type uh, customers, including Quark customers, to Russia, and we did the Bering Strait. And we did it mostly with leased uh, Russian research vessels. So probably the most you'd ever have on a single ship would be about 45. And uh, there are tremendous things to see. Uh, and then there were other ship, uh, other companies that have come along that have done the Kuriles North on the Asian side and just like the as you mentioned in the cabotage thing we couldn't we couldn't have somebody leave Nome and come back to Nome in an Amer in a non-american ship so we had to fly them into into Russia um, one of the things with the absence of of infrastructure at this point is that every time a ship comes or goes to the United States we've got to fly a customs person out there and that cost me five grand and on 25 people that's pretty expensive um, uh, Alaska's laws required ship pilotage in places where I would argue we didn't need it necessarily. There wasn't any much to hit, but uh, um, and the insurers weren't necessarily requiring it either. So there's there are a number of things that could be done to improve cruise ship tourism throughout the North. I know I, I've talked with one of your competitors who is interested in finishing the Northwest Passage and coming coming into Alaska, but. Um, it's probably our rules, not your rules, that has, has dissuaded them. Uh, we have another thing going on, and this goes to your point about corridors. And I just want to make this, this point, because sometime in your career, you're going to be sitting in a discussion, and somebody's going to suggest corridors in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, corridors that are broad corridors make a whole lot of sense. But the main thing about corridors to me is 
anything we write down in a regulation today about where wildlife is, is not necessarily where wildlife is tomorrow. And uh, besides, uh, uh, besides making sure that we don't have pollution incidences, we all have to work very carefully to minimize noise and to, to minimize uh, strikes or so forth with marine mammals. And so the idea of dynamic routing is, is very important. We're going through this discussion right now. I pushed as a lieutenant governor, literally after a conference like this, I went for a walk in the woods with the Russian ambassador and we got started on what became the PARS cooperation between the United States and Russia that IMO approved to get uh, routing. And we made it dynamic and we also said we want the United States and Russia to be joined at the hip and we got that started, uh, finished, it started under President Obama, but it got finished at the, it, during the Trump administration during one of the toughest times in U.S.-Russia relations. And I'm very proud of that. We're now working on a PARS study that we went back to, to, to your slide of the, of the corridors. I will tell you that um, uh, the whalers want you offshore, the people in the boats want to be inshore, there's, there's all sorts of discussions, and nobody can tell you what the ice is going to be any given day or the wildlife uh, population there. So by corridor, I think what you're meaning is availability of services than drawing a straight line, but I just want to make that point. We've been very aggressive from the Alaskan side of not trying to get it down to a footpath type corridor simply because what's good today may not be good tomorrow because of wildlife or ice. But in order to have good broad corridors, we need good charting and we're still pushing on that. Maybe if I jump in. So certainly in the Canadian context, it, it, absolutely right. You know, the wildlife and, and the ice move. We had a situation this past year where the corridor that you would see on the map was chock full of ice, but right next to it wasn't, right? And so industry very much pointed that out. Uh, but we are, uh, what we're working on is a model with Inuit uh, hunters specifically, who especially around the wildlife have a very good idea and, and looking at, well, what's the model where we can actually take their traditional knowledge of knowing uh, what's happening out on the water and incorporate it into the model so that we can re traffic perhaps for the coming season so that's something a conversation we're very live in uh, I, I don't have a comment maybe on on the tourism sp industry specifically but I can say that uh, you know the Canadian and US Coast Guard have a, a very long-standing relationship perhaps more in the south than in the north however on the you know our progress with low-impact shipping quarters the PAR study that meet discusses the US uh, and Canadian Coast Guards are very much engaged in the, in the dialogue of how can we have a, a seamless system now it's a bit different than either you know the example in the, in the Bering Strait where you kind of have uh, waters that's between the two and you know in this case it would be kind of through Alaska then through Canada but nevertheless we recognize the uh, you know the opportunity for us to to have something that's fairly standardized and perhaps newer for us is the relationship with the Danes and and more specifically the Greenlandic uh, folks because you know, in Canada, we, we look at the map, and of course, the U.S. is our neighbor, right? We know that. We're in North America together, and Europe is very far away. Well, in fact, you know, Greenland is just a, a stone's throw across the water from Iqaluit. And so we, uh, I was actually in Greenland and Nuuk this summer having a conversation. We're about to sign a collaboration agreement with the Danish Defence Forces, who are responsible for Coast Guard and Defence Force uh, uh, services in Greenland, uh, because we see huge opportunity. The reality is right now, both of our... Um, I guess both of our kind of standard operating procedures would be if we needed help, we would look south. They'd look to Copenhagen, we'd look to other parts of Canada instead of saying, well, wait a second, we're almost, we're, we're almost next door neighbors here. Why wouldn't the first call, if I have a problem in Calvert and I need help, be to my counterparts in Nuke as opposed to looking to you know, my, one of my own colleagues in St. John's, for example. So that's something that we, we want to explore and hopefully over time that will benefit all industry, including the cruise uh, tourism industry. With the, uh, the range of helicopters and the number of people you can get on a helicopter, is it just going to be a case of luck that you happen to be in the right part of the Arctic at the right time? Uh, or, or is it feasible to have some kind of matrix of coverage? Well, there is. I mean, right now, there, uh, the challenge is, so in the maritime search and rescue world in Canada, 
national defense, the Canadian forces are responsible for the air and we're, we do the marine. Now in reality, most of our icebreakers have a helicopter on board and will form part of the search and rescue. Uh, but you want a, a dirty little secret in talking to our Norwegian counterparts, the incident that they had just offshore, like literally just offshore, where it was a five minute ferrying helicopter ride. Uh, they got everybody off the ship, uh, but they, they said to us, if that was much further out, wouldn't have been the same result, right? And, and that's something that, uh, I, it's a very important conversation to have because you can only ferry a few individuals at a time. And that's aside from getting into the, well, where do we put them? We're gonna we're fly them all into uh, the community and then you know, leave that and deplete the resources for the year. So there are, there are multiple layers of challenges that we kind of have to work through uh, collectively, but uh, it, it, you're absolutely right. So it's not just a funding problem, it's a logistical yes. uh, challenge that we don't have all the answers to right now. Yeah. You know, Matthew, when you ask that question, if I put my SAR hat back on, um, I've always said a big part of SAR is luck. Is if it happens, you know, you have your SAR stations, you have the ships, sometimes it happens next door, sometimes it doesn't. And as, as Neil said, the Viking Sky was next door. So, uh, yeah, should we have more? I've got the Navy fellow looking at me now. Should we have more uh, Air Force helicopters in the Arctic? I'd say, yeah, the answer is yes. But, um, you know, it's uh, well, resources. The state, the state of Alaska actually. Uh, to, to, to move our Coast Guard and our National Guard capability north, we actually went and leased and paid for the lease or, or on, on hangars to, to move that forward during Shell's exploration days. Um, and the concept operations we have on the LNG project I talked about earlier, we're, we're probably going to be paying for our own helicopter for crew resupply. Um, and uh, uh, I'm sure th that'll be there. The North Slope Borough is the only municipality in the United States that actually pays for a Learjet and a couple of full-time helicopters to be able to do search and rescue because it's, uh, we're 800 miles, 1,000 miles from the Coast Guard, nearest Coast Guard year-round helicopters. So we're trying to see that move into the north. Uh, Jessica, I was, I was just going to say kind of in the watch this space area, there's a few things happening. I think the Coast Guard Forum and what, what you spoke about in terms of new cooperation with, with Greenland is, is pretty important. What we've just done with Russia is pretty important. What's happening on the PARS route there is significant. Um, I, the, there is a motion about, at least in think tank world, by a piece that I just got trying to suggest that the Arctic Council do a new marine shipping assessment. So we'll see if that comes about. Uh, I paid for the first one when I was chair of the commission, I say I did, I mean, we could have used the money for something else. So, and, I, and there was no other government agency in the U.S. who even believed Arctic shipping was important enough to pay the bill. Uh, Canada and Iceland were also co-sponsors and, and, and did quite a bit, but we sent Captain Lawson Brigham pretty much everywhere in the Arctic um, to help develop the agenda that we've now by and large achieved but except for the, the capital finance. So if we get that, I hope we get another capital finance discussion. Uh, the mandatory polar code, uh, I believe I first sent people to a mandatory, or to a polar code meeting in the early 90s, and we finally got it uh, you know, operational uh, now about two years ago. And the insurance industry helped push that to happen, but it's also one of the things the polar code says, don't go into the, don't go into the Arctic without, say, a heated lifeboat, mm -hmm. uh, but also uh, use the best practices. And understanding what kind of forum that brings it about best practices is something that we look at. Uh, and then this legislation. I think this legislation has got, got an opportunity. But it, it, in some ways, it comes down to this. There are some places that don't want a whole lot of new shipping. I mean, I've, you know, I've heard Alaska community saying, but it's this cruise ship with 300 people who showed up and there, there's more people walking around town than live in town, you know? And that's a best practices issue that I know your industry is dealing with. With 26 new ships on the drawing board, there's going to be more coming. Um, and we've had to deal with that in Southeast Alaska with over a million cruise ship passengers a year and getting additional facilities to avoid overcrowding. Uh, so so that's, that's coming, but I actually just believe that we have to decide as Arctic residents, do we want Russia to be a monopoly in, tra in transcontinental shipping? I don't think it's in Canada and the U.S. interests or in the Western countries' interest to do it. Uh, I, I believe that Japan, Korea, and even China agree with us about that. And it's not 
this is not an anti-Russian statement. It's just simply, if you internationalize this process, we're probably all better off from a security standpoint. And we've done that with aviation. I'm, I, you know, when I got out of grad school, uh, I flew off into Korea on KAL 007, the aircraft the Russians shot down. Today, I'll spend uh, several hours a month flying over Russia, going to Asia or going to the Middle East. And the point, the point that I'm getting at is we've made aviation boring in that regard. Uh, until recent in incidences of flight to Dubai included three hours over, over Iran. And, and we need to make Arctic shipping boring. And that is going to mean, you know, more cooperation and fostering the, uh, the resources that we need. Um, I'm going to open it up to some questions. I just have to laugh really quick. So are you saying, this is all a sideline conversation, collective security is a good thing? <laughs> oh, 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 oh. And the importance of that. And, um, and I, um, I, you know, this is it's just really this discussion. Is the, it's the chicken and egg discussion we've been having really all day. But the um, truth be told, the end of the matter is there will be more ships. There's going to be more um, of a tourism effort. And, and, and then it comes down to um, a security, like a sovereignty and, and security issue. Um, and, you know, and so we, it's, it's, it's plugging on. If we, we could get this marine assessment kind of focused actually more on, on the financing piece, like a part two of not to, uh, that's what, that'd be, that'd be that's what our legislation's about. So. There we go. I'm going to open it up to some questions. Um, if anyone has uh, anything they want to talk about. Yep. Uh, this question is for uh, Peter. How important is um, <coughs> internet access for your cruisers? Say that first, please. How important is broadband or internet ah. for your cruisers? And what sort of services do you offer today? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a really good question. Uh, everybody wants to be connected. Everybody wants to send their pictures back and stay in touch. Um, so it is important, uh, but because we go to isolated areas where people want to get away from it all, if there's no access, it's kind of like, I've got away from it all. So um, on one hand, it's, it's not important, but when the weather's good and everything's great, you had a great day, you want to send it and you can't, it might be frustrating. Uh, the side of that, though, is when something goes wrong, um, we all know that uh, broadband really broadcasts it very quickly. Um, and not, nothing's wrong with that at all, but um, it's just a sidebar mention of what, what broadband can bring you. But uh, the isolation part um, is what I would say that people are trying to do, get away from it all. Okay, and, and what, what, what do you not have? Like Iridium, uh, narrowband services at Warren, or? Uh, you know, that's different from every ship, because uh, for Quark, we're, we're both own one of our own ships, but the other ships we charter, every ship is different, what it has. But usually it has a wide spectrum of, of part of the pun, but a wide spectrum of, of, uh, of uh, gear that will, they can use, be it uh, narrow band direct printing or, or just internet or anything. Other questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, I guess for me and actually uh, the two other folks from Canada, so nobody wants to say we're going to do it for security, but doesn't it just make sense that what we did with airlines and routes, that we would do the same with the Passage on how it all transpires, come together as like-minded Greenland, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, all Canada, U.S., come together and reunite. Uh, Russian things that I do, but I certainly don't want them to be the only ones up there. Sure. sure. And, you know, you have a situation right now where, uh, you know, if, if uh, aside, say, from invading Crimea, Russian has, Russia has been kind of a bad actor when it, when it comes to turning off the tap for coercive purposes, okay? And we've, we've done a huge amount of things as allies together to get pipelines around the Caspian and, and to do other things to not put ourselves in a vulnerable position. And yet at the same time, in a global market of 300 million tons of LNG in 2018, Russia is now selling between Yamal and Sakhalin, probably uh, 25, and expects to sell 100. Okay, and and so the and then Norway actually has had had cargoes go from Snow White to Snow Vite to to Asia as well via the Northern Sea Route. So I guess I would say that it's important enough for glo global energy security alone to make sure that no one nation can turn off the tap. And, and that we should be cooperating on getting this infrastructure 
going. Now, how much of that is going to come out of my friend in the Navy's bill compared to his other missions around the world, of which they're substantial, I don't know. All I know is that we're trying to get them to think about it, and when it comes to you know, the question that was just ad asked about comms, uh, a group of us wrote a book on North American Arctic security recently where the, where the chapter I contributed said that we're not doing enough to, compare, to build cooperation between civil needs and security needs so that you get the thing to, hap to happen faster. Uh, but I uh, thank you for asking the question. I agree with you. If I could add one thing to that, too, is when we compare flights going over in a matter of hours, uh, where they really don't touch anything, they use the space, when the ship enters the waters, it's got to navigate everything days and days and days. So it has a greater opportunity of maybe bumping into something. So I used to be involved in vessel traffic services, and that's part of what the uh, Coast Guard does in, in, on all waters. And uh, the word we got, well, people uh, may question whether uh, the Canadian Arctic is sovereign water. They really like the fact that there are Coast Guards in Greenland, there are Coast Guards in the States and Canada that are checking and balancing where a ship is, where it's going, where it can go on ice and where it can't go on ice, because it's there for days, not just for a couple of hours. No, I was just going to say, last, last question? Or do you well, want I could just add quickly. From the Canadian yeah. perspective, I mean, and, and not, you know, I'm not going to step out of my lane and speak about defence. That being said, I, I, um, last week I was at a conference in Ottawa around modernizing North American defence, and that whole topic and what Meade was talking about was very front and centre, both with, with US and, and Canadian military counterparts. Um, so I think there, there is certainly a recognition uh, uh, that, that it's an issue, and... Uh, just to your point, Mead, about uh, you know bringing the security and civil together. Uh, I know my my colleague, who is the commander of JTFN in uh, Yellowknife, which is our Joint Task Force North, responsible for uh, defense security, uh, will talk often about the importance of, of of bringing that that together. And you know the example that he always uses that I 100% agree with is that if we had better communications, well, that's good for defense. It's good for Coast Guard purposes. It's also good for the individual communities and helps them economically. And and so I think that as a as a country, we need to be looking at those investments that kind of get, uh, that hit on multiple different uh, levels, uh, because that's how we're going to be able to convince people that it makes the most sense. You're not just getting it, you're not just investing for military purposes, but you're investing for things that are going to benefit the, all, all different kinds of people in the spectrum. Just the main point, because Carcara is expecting a million tourists a year coming up. Little Carcara, 300 people. There's a million people that get off boats in Skagway. And not a little car crash. Any of our biggest concern is toilets. A million people have to travel across the country. What are they going to do with They're going to do that in the Arctic. All I can say for what that train has charged me, they ought to pay Bayon for a toilet. <laughs> Well, let's do one last question, and then we can continue all kinds of conversations, but over drinks, okay, and food. Just to, to, to clarify, and just maybe pile on to yes. the question, essentially, you, you can't extract uh, resources from the air. Okay, and that's why it's not apples, it's apples and oranges. And so we're, we're considering it as internal waterways, right, because there's resources to be extracted. So, so there, there is a sort of political bent to you as well, and how do you get into, you know, uh, an agreement? And I don't know, and, and that is, that is there is the trillion dollar question of, uh, you know, who can pass through and who can actually, um, and I, it's not a, it's really up for debate, but what I'm getting at is, it was easier to do it in the, in the sort of air corridor and aviation world just because there really wasn't that much skin in it. But now, you know, we're talking about, and our mandate is beyond the EEZ, frankly, uh, economic exclusion zone, so we're, we're, we're beyond the horizon. This is new for the Navy to be in our internal waters, not doing you know what we call our Great Lakes tour, where we say, hey, come on, join the Navy, of actually patrolling our own waters. You know, so so this, this question mark's there, and we do have a strategy that I'm not going to share, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but the point is, is that uh, you know it's, it's a difficult discussion. I think that had had, had it been easy, they would solve it, and there would be some agreements on the, on the table. Oh. I, I, I'm just going to. We can take this offline, but uh, Canada proposed a fix in Law of the Sea that basically allows countries with traditional ice covered areas. Uh, it's Article 234. Uh, I was a senior federal official. I could not get the State Department to voice a U.S. position on 234, even though we had agreed to it. I couldn't get them to say in a congressional hearing what it was. And the basic concern is, I mean, I mean our guys are, are 
side by side. We're, uh, our countries are not, not in conflict with each other. We do so much together and we will do so much together. But the, the, the problem is, is that, a, that particular accommodation to Canada in 1972 or, or 78 uh, was, is one that I guess our guys haven't really bought off on, not because they don't agree, like Canada, because they're afraid that somebody's going to do it to us in the Straits of Gibraltar or some other, some other place. And I think what I'm saying is, you know, we made Law of the Sea happen to begin with by separating the economic issues from the sovereignty issues. And I guess I would say that for the safety of shipping, let's look at the economic issues. If, you, if, if, if you've got particular resources, whether it's a bunch of seals or a community which wants to have its culture protected, you know, that wants to say no shipping here, I believe there are ways to accommodate that. There are, and as a matter of fact, sorry to, to pile on again, but essentially what NORAD has been doing and how it was established, I mean, the U.S. is paying for the fuel for those sites, and yet the infrastructure, we're managing it the North Morning sites. And right now we're looking at NORAD to what's called MDA, Maritime, Maritime a Domain Awareness, so, which is really for a security perspective. But it's gonna be under the period of, um, purview of NORAD. They're calling it NORAD Next, uh, for instance, and we're still scratching our heads. What, what does NORAD Next look like, right? So I do think there's an opportunity. There's a lot of discussions at play right now and that you, know, you can fit a lot in when you say MDA, you know, Maritime Domain Awareness. What does it mean? Is it a physical apparatus? Is it satellites? Is it new ports? It, I, I don't know, uh, frankly. So I think under NORAD, there's going to be a lot of precedent that can be set down the road. Fascinating. Interesting. Um, and I'm going to leave it there.